and we are recording. Now, I want to thank Ken and David for joining us again. Uh, we met with Ken. I met with Ken almost a month ago uh, now, and David about two weeks ago, and we had unbelievable sessions. I mean, Ken really covered a variety of different subjects. If I look back at what we covered, we spoke about the history of what it got to where we are today, where the drawing in the 1970s really started with people just opening up the doors and insurance companies coming to realize, hey, we can just dry things. We don't have to rip it out. And it changed how insurance companies looked at it. But a lot of it forgot about the physics um, and Ken really, that, that's really the biggest aspect of why Ken wrote this book, Leadership and restore, rest, Restorative Drying, Restorative Drying. And it really changed the dynamics for a lot of um, a lot of different things that really changed how people look at things and how and, and, and why people do certain things. Um, and and I cannot really describe why Ken wrote his book better than Ken himself can. So Ken, before I go on, can you just tell everybody why you wrote your book? Oh, wow. Well, first of all, it's really nice to be back here, Penny. Thank you for having us come back. Um, the inspiration for that book, it's actually kind of a long story, but um, to make a very long story short, here's what happened. I uh, wrote several articles for trade journals over many years, and uh, um, I used to teach uh, IICRC courses from training materials that I would use from um, with the with the approval of other instructors or other schools for the IICRC. They said, and it's not uncommon among IICRC instructors that if you don't have your own training materials, you can get permission from another school to use their training materials. So to make um, this very long story short, I found myself in need to make some training materials of my own rather than using other people's training materials. And so that's what inspired the creation of the book. And I took many of my old articles that I wrote from for trade journals, and I used that as a springboard to try and you know, create a table of contents on subjects that I found to be relevant to many restorers. And that started this, you know, little ball of, you know, a few articles in a you know collection of in, in a book to becoming more and more robust until you end up with this 530 page, you know, document that is, you know, now being used in courts uh, for resolving um, disputes in court cases. And uh, it's used in uh, the RIA's education, uh, the IICRC's education, and actually surprisingly, it's used in Purdue University for those seeking a degree in construction management with a focus on catastrophe response. And uh, so it's used even in universities now. So um, yeah, it's kind of taken legs of its own and become quite popular in the industry. Well, and well, ACAC. Here... Go ahead, David. Oh, and also it's used as a one of the core reference texts for uh, ACAC. Oh, American that's right, Council too. I Accredited forgot. Certification. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. There's another Quite one. broadly. <laughs> what I'm hearing from you and, and what I was thinking of the book as it's taking all the, you know, all that thought process that a lot of people were based on opinions and I put it based on facts and brought down the facts together. And that's why what I'm hearing from you now is actually this, because it's all based on facts, is being used uh, in, in court trials, et cetera. Right. It's, it's got a foundation that um, uh, extends beyond the IICRC standard and starts addressing the actual chemistry and physics of how you change water from a uh, you know, liquid phase to a gas phase and how you manage that. And it's, um, yeah, I just got really into the science of it all in this book. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, you know, we had a wonderful hour and a half in, in our last session, Ken. And then I went ahead and we spoke, I spoke with David and that hour and a half turned to three hours, which was another story altogether. And we spoke about- a few I'll different be better things. today. <laughs> yeah, well, we spoke <laughs> about a few different things. Uh, we spoke about, uh, equilibrium, how we have to recognize the equilibrium throughout the building because things, the variables change so rapidly. Um, we spoke about 
Uh, we spoke about, you know, looking at the whole area as a whole, once again, because of that equilibrium. And we spoke about, most importantly, the documentation. Um, and I want to kind of take the next few moments to go over a few of the basic, or should I say that protocol of what it is that has to go through um, in a normal drying process so that we cover the beer, the beer basics. That way we can open it up to questions um, and really broaden what we're looking at so that we can actually answer questions. So to cover the, the, the concepts, I mean, there's main, mainly two elements, two key elements, what I, from what my understanding of our conversation last time, um, which cover two, two and elements. Number one, you have the safety, the OSHA safety guidelines that have to be looked at. And number two is documentation. Those are the key elements, but we're looking at everything. Now, that may be key elements, but then we actually have to go through the protocol, which begin with the safety guidelines, you know, based on OSHA, um, and continue. And once again, a lot of these intermingle with one another. So even though I'm putting it, it together as a map, we have to recognize that a lot of them intermingle with one another. So you have safety, which is OSHA number one. You have moisture mapping and sampling as number two. You have classification and categorization as number three. You have stabilization as number four. Now, when we talk about stabilization, there's a variety of things that we're going to continue on as we continue through this next hour and a half to almost two hours. Um, but if we look back, we have to re recognize that as a insured, and I know Victor is over here from Rainbow, and he's been very helpful with my cousin, and it it's really changes the dynamic uh, when we talk about a lot of different things. Um, but but at the end of the day, we have we have the factor that we need to get permission from the mitigate from the insurer insurance company because at the end of the day, in their in the policy, it says that we have to give them the ability to inspect. But at the same time, it also tells us that we have to protect the property. So as a catch twenty two, it's like where where do we fall? And my conversation with yourself, David, and I believe Ken is also on the same opinion that on a general job, we're going to give it ten business days. For the insurance company, once again, a general job meaning a small job, that we're going to give the insurance company 10 business days to respond to us. So we're going to go in there, we're going to stabilize, and obviously we're taking care of those initial things of, of moisture and sampling, moisture mapping and sampling. We're taking care of that safety, um, and we're doing what we need to to really recognize the classification, recognize what we have to do. But now in our stabilization mode, we're going to stable a place. And we're going to give the insurance company 10 day, 10 business days with us notifying them. So yes, the public adjuster may be the one responsible to notify, but we want to make sure we're also in direct communication as a mitigation company. And we're going to give them up to 10 business days to do it. Otherwise, we'll come in and do the work itself. That being said, anytime there is something out of the ordinary, like a safety mm -hmm. standard or... Um, or any time that it's a large loss, that 10 day window may be out, maybe that 10 day time frame may be out of the window. David and Ken, are you both in agreement with that? Once again, as a suggested time frame. Well, I see that a little bit differently. And, and David, I think you, you're probably better to answer that. I've, I've never heard the 10 day threshold, Penny. I don't know where that came from. That's what surprises me. Um, <laughs> So in Florida, for instance, uh, it, there's a weird law in Florida. In fact, there's lots of weird laws in Florida. I mean, it is Florida after all. But um, in the insurance <laughs> industry, um, the, the insurance company has 90 days to determine coverage on an insurance claim, a, like a property insurance claim. 90 days they can wait and just keep you waiting before they tell you if you've got a covered claim or not. And so the 10 day window would be insufficient. They, in Florida, they have up to 90 days. And it's not uncommon that we will, as contractors, be waiting you know, 89 days with the, the structure in a stabilization phase. Just that's where we're not drying, we're not mitigating, we're just holding the building in a safe, healthy, comfortable living environment so that the humidity that is produced by the water intrusion, the original water intrusion, does not evaporate and soak into and compromise the unaffected materials. That's the objective of stabilization. It has nothing to do with drying. It's just to keep the unaffected materials from becoming affected. 
And in Florida, that's up to 90 days. What do you say, David? Uh, you got your mute on. Oh. No, he's on two different screens. Yeah. Am I okay? Oh, yeah, you're on your phone. Yeah, I'm, I'm on my headset. Yeah, I'm, I'm out in the wild roaming today. Okay. Uh, the, um, I think there's two conversations, um, actually three. First is, what do you owe to the standard and statute, which is the discovery? Well, and I would, I would argue that would also be to the insured. Uh, the discovery of the environment, quantification of the environment, then we complicate that by the contract duties, which you as a host or as a contractor don't owe, but your client definitely does. You definitely don't want to do something that would prejudice their rights and cause them an issue for coverage. So that's the second thing. And then the, the third thing would be your liability as a contractor, because I'm going to promise you no matter how many days you put on it, someone will be unhappy. It's too many or too little, no matter what. So there's three different questions I think that have to be addressed in this, some functional competency, some liability that you're taking on for the client, and then the liability you take on as a contractor. And it should be a, um, it needs to be a well thought out response to where you decide the liability is. And then the way to fix this so that you don't feel like it's unfixable is really in your documentation strings. The way that you put your material interested parties, including the carrier, on notice that we have to do all of these things. We're waiting granularly on this and this and this and this and this. Now, part of this is sampling, but part of this is you having to respond to us. Part of this is they do have you caught. They have you in dueling obligations, or at least the insurer in dueling obligations to both mitigate or prevent further damage as it's identified in the duties after loss section, all right, and to provide inspections as often as reasonably necessary. How do you aggressively mitigate and preserve a property for a carrier's inspection? So you have dueling obligations, they are mutually exclusive in their exercise, and you as a company have to realize that you're gonna put your client and you both in, a, in some level of position of responsibility for how that's handled. So it's a broader conversation. The stabilization, Ken and I and Chris Resnowski have all published on this. I think we're pretty much in an agreement of 68 to 82 degrees and 35 to 55% relative humidity in our environments, all right? Um, we may differ in if we wanna check what's in the wall cavities, because that's part of the structure. Um, but it's something that you should discuss. Once we're past that, now we have to help the insured understand the obligations that they're supposed to be up, which is where a public adjuster or an attorney become very, very important. They do have contractual obligations, and we call an insurance uh, policy a policy, but in reality, it's an insurance contract. And I think we, we behave differently if we thought of it as a contract. There are obligations. There are requirements, and if you fail to meet them, start to get people start to get damaged, you or them. And then how do you as a company want to manage your reputation, manage your liability? Because again, I'm going to promise you that I have never seen a single, single loss that's passed and crossed my desk, either as a restoration company or as a consultant or expert, where the insurance company and the material interested parties thought that the delay for stabilization was the right number of days. You will be wrong no matter what, because they're going to fight one way or the other. Yep. They're going to fight the delay. They're going to fight the direct. Um, each has their liabilities. It's how well you define and document those things um, that make the difference in whether or not you end up being litigated. Uh, or, you know, maybe you'll be litigated or we'll have to go to collections, but will you be successful in collections? You are creating a narrative of what you did, why you did it, and distributing it to everybody. I got news for you. You're, you're done before you start. You're wrong before you've even begun because they'll just take the other position. And your position is as unquantifiably defensible as theirs is. Because the standard doesn't direct us on how to do it, does it, Ken? It doesn't. No. So, you know, the standard, thankfully, in this round of revisions, we can, we, we can thank uh, Mr. Myers and a couple other people for ensuring that we at least see the language, the uh, the verbiage and the, and the word stabilization in the actual standard, but they've not weighed down on how to quantify it yet. So this is all wild west in the sense that everybody gets to 
have an opinion where they have an opinion, unless of course you park your facts where they'd like to park their opinions. If you put facts where their opinions are, you limit that liability narrower and narrower and narrower and narrower. You report more and draw everybody out in the conversation, the liability becomes narrower and narrower and narrower. That's a really long answer to a really short question, which I'm famous for, I know. But this is the discussion as you're looking as a PA or as a contractor or as a consultant, you're going to have to manage this whether you realize it or not. You'll manage it up front, or you're going to manage it at the end. And the question is, how much does it cost to manage it at the end? I like to control my risk. So, you might want to push your earpiece in a little bit farther, David. You're kind of in a tin can. Doesn't sound very good. Oh, no. Is that yeah. any better? A little bit better. A little bit. Yeah. Okay. Let me, uh, let me know and send the back back out. Right. I was reviewing this morning. I listened to um, most of our sessions. Um, most, uh, most, if not the entire uh, four and a half hours. And I was also reviewing a lot of the IICRC this morning. Um, and you know, there's there's a few specifics to point out, especially when we're looking at stabilization. We have a, a 12.3.5 that both of you guys brought up, um, which really covers, um, which which really at the end of the day covers a different aspect of you know, it, it's telling us to to be careful and and well, not to be careful, but to make sure the job's done right. Really, um, if I look back at it, at um, at the actual wording. Uh, twelve point three point three. Um, it covers. So once again, we have different different points. So one second, I just mentioned twelve point three point five. Um, and if we look back at twelve point three point five, it co covers the humidity control and contaminated in the contaminated structure. And it does talk about going through and making sure that the humidity throughout the building. Um, and, and it says the affected areas, but then it covers you know also outside the area. We also have reference. Um, we also have reference in 10.63, it talks about documenting the extent of the damage of migration. And that's where it really points out the rooms around. And 10.6.5 is secondary damage, once again, controlling it. There's a variety of different things that I think every single restorer and everybody here really has to take control and look at. Um, and I'm sure that the results of this calls will be some additional articles. Uh, that'll hopefully be able to be put together and 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 help some people, um, but there's a variety of things that really most people have to be have to be aware of, and a lot of this comes down to the drawing is not relevant until you actually can identify the areas, do the moisture mapping, and open up the areas of drying. And a lot of people go through well, we're going through the three day drying, which we all know is just almost, if not completely, not possible. Um, and one of the things we have to recognize when we're looking at the, uh, the IICRC standards is that number one, the drying is not beginning until you actually open up the walls so that you could dry in the walls. And number two, you actually have to clean the walls. It doesn't just say drying, it also says cleaning. Is that correct, Ken and David? Um, that's a really interesting distinction. Um, to clean and dry the structure. The structure, uh, I don't think the sentence exists that you as clearly as you said it, but the sequence that it's laid out in the standard identifies how you're supposed to remove the bulk water and make sure that the structure is in a category one condition before you begin drying. So category one, for those of you who might be tuning in and, and unaware of what we're talking about when we say category, we're talking about the degree of contamination of the water that's in the building. If it's fresh water, it's category one. If it's significantly contaminated water, that's uh, category two. And grossly contaminated is category three. You can't begin drying until you are verified that it is in a category one condition. So if you've got a category two or three loss, no air movers are supposed to be installed until it's been tested and verified to be sanitary. Otherwise you're blowing stuff around that, well, you might, you're probably blowing stuff around without knowing it. And if you put, you know, an unhealthy microorganism on Mrs. Jones child's pillow and they get a sniffle, well, there's your liability. All they have to do is associate whatever the sniffle is with what the residue is on the floor. Now, you know, we're trying to manage our 
liability exposure. And I mean, something as obvious as that should have us all on uh, high alert. Beautiful, understood. Um, going back to, once again, we're really reviewing um, at least the call with, with David and, and, and what, what we went through. Um, we went down to the next one of, once again, confirming that we're satisfying the safety concerns of OSHA and hygienist testing, which we started at the beginning, but we always have to revisit that once we've gone through the stabilization mode, making sure that everything is satisfied before we start with the mitigation of actually doing the demo work as needed, which once again, as we outlined, drawing does not begin until we, and, and as Ken just clarified, you're at a clean, clean point where you're actually on a class, a, a class one, class, a class one um, water, uh, so category that, one, category class one, is you a say little different. class and yeah. category one water um, factor. Right. Um, so then once again, once that's done, we're going back to double checking the moisture mapping, making sure that everything is actually dry. It, it is actually um, in the right setup um, and then dry as needed. And once again, in drying, we said clean, uh, clean as required by the hygienist, followed by drying properly and verify category one before starting to dry. Um, and then once we're done, the confirmed dry and clean and all standards have been met. Once again, I said, said something at the end of it, that's, that's, that's all standards have been met. And that's something that a lot of people uh, don't, don't clearly outline within the dynamics. You, we have to remember that a standard means that a wood should be, 100, should be at the drying levels that a wood is supposed to be, not just because well, I don't care, or, or or I'm comparing it to something else. It's what should that wood be? Because what is that center point within the wood? And a lot of people go ahead and say, okay, fine, I can put my moisture meter on it. It's dry. No, not necessarily. Because what about the center of that wood? What is that pre-loss condition? And what's going to happen down the line if I went ahead and I did a three-day drying? Now, what's going to happen three days after that? Um, is that moisture going to start seeping out? And this was a lot of what me and David spoke about in our last call, is that first three days of drying, nine out of 10 times, you've actually only dried the rest of the area. And I don't care if you've put up your moisture barriers, because at the end of the day, the moisture barriers is limiting how much moisture is exchanging between your area and everywhere else. But if you've come in and you've identified, well, we're this is the area of damage and therefore we're putting in our drying equipment here or our stabilization equipment here well the icrc and in in 10.6.5 talks about secondary damages and it mentions that you have to you have to keep you have to also test the levels outside that barrier well a lot of people forget about looking about that and they only look at the inside of the barrier but what about outside the, the barrier have you been testing those levels because those three days, as David had pointed out, normally you're actually leveling off the moisture level in the other area with that area, and the drying does not even did not even begin. Ken and David, are you both, Ken, are you in agreement with that statement? You go, Dave. David, I am, and I and I watched my eyes darting around here. I wanted to give you the other reference. Ken started with this. This is the basic one that changed everything in 2015. Uh, it's 1.2.3. It's the same in the 2015 and 2022. Restorers should, in order to meet the requirements of the standard, attempt to control the spread of contaminants and moisture to minimize further damage from occurring to the structure, systems, and content. When contaminants are present, which indicates you must be sampling, because you couldn't possibly know if they're present if you don't, um, remediators or restorers should remediate first which changed our orientation from rushing in and tearing everything apart to one of coming in, identifying if hazards are present because it then goes to say, you should remediate first and then drive the structure systems and contents. So that period of time for us to stabilize is the requirement to identify if there are contaminants present. And by the way, guys, this isn't primarily an IACRC thing. This is an OSHA thing. There's a silica standard, our statute, there's a, um, a, a lead statute, there's an asbestos statute that all require it. And if you go back into the disclaimer for the standard of care, it's going to tell you before you start anything else, it's your requirement to meet all federal, state, and local statutes, regulations, etc. So they don't go over them in here as well. They presume that you understand and abide by OSHA 
or if you happen to be in Canada or Australia, the corresponding, uh, the corresponding bodies. But this is the idea. If you have to see and know whether or not contaminants are present, you've got to call that period of time something. And you have to stabilize it because you can't let it decline because there's a contractual obligation to prevent further damage. So this is what we do. This is why we do it. And notice it says that you remediate first before you dry. So that period of time, not only to do your discovery, but also once you've done your discovery, then to go ahead and do your demolition, your cleaning, and return it back to the two terms that can use, that the industry seems to need just a tiny bit more reinforcement in, which is category one and condition one, all right, until we're clean and we can uh, dry it as a whole, knowing that we're not going to cross-contaminate the structure, then we can actually dry. So that's how it started off. And this is this is the, the underlying predicate for, you know, what do we do with our time? What do we call our time? Why are we stabilized? You brought up the humidity control on a project. Well, this is the humidity control portion of the project. And again, I'm going to tell you, folks, if you don't document this, if you don't create a drying plan and a stabilization plan um, that actually identifies these criteria then somebody's going to come back and put an opinion for your fact and your agreement with the material interested parties should have been. So I think I answered your question, but I, I want you guys to know back in the standard, when I teach the standard class, like I'm going to do next week, um, we start, this is the very first thing that we begin with because it reorders everything we do and it necessitates stabilization and the kinds of inspections that are typically overlooked. As a PA, if you guys miss these inspections, if you're, in, if you're a restoration contractor, miss these inspections, you miss half to three quarters of the actual loss. And that's just where the direct physical water went. There's water vapor carrying all kinds of contaminants from place to place. And God help you if you tear stuff apart. What used to be in one place that you can't prove if you don't sample was just in that one place. You are now blamed for being all over the structure whenever anybody comes back behind it. Um, this is how these little projects. And you know, we did talk last time. Are you doing five thousand dollars of work on a five thousand dollar project? Or are you doing five thousand dollars of work on a thirty-five or forty thousand dollar project? It doesn't make you dishonest if the project really is forty thousand dollars. But as consultant PA a contractor, if you don't identify the true scope of that loss, if you don't quantify it with science, most of my time spent arguing um, as an expert often because a contractor just didn't collect the science because they didn't think they could pay for it or because they didn't want to bear the expense of it while they were trying to get paid because you do have to pay industrial hygienists and people like Ken and myself up front to do this. But when the time comes to argue about it, you not doing it is their excuse for why it's not owed. I can show you a 125 page opinion from a very large TPC and 60 pages of it are all because the contractor didn't do what the standard of care was. And the contractor's response to that is, well, number one, no one asked me to, which is fair. They had a chance to do it on their own and that's a mitigating factor. But if he'd have done it, if they'd have performed all those tests, all right, if they'd have performed at the end of their project, if they would have kept their time, if they would have met the requirement of the standard of care, a good 70 pages, that 125 page would have never gotten written. If they would have published it, about 80 pages wouldn't have gotten written. Because this eliminates this conversation, this argument up front, which, by the way, if I can plug for Ken and kind of myself as well, but Ken mostly, by an RTPE or, or, or a loss consultant, a technical loss consultant, really should be on every project because it's all okay till the bill comes in. It's all okay until somebody sees a number they don't like. If you haven't quantified that stuff up front, it will be a war of opinions at the end rather than a discussion of facts. Ken produces quantifiable, verifiable facts. You as a contractor and PA publish those facts in a way that makes all the materially interested parties responsible for their distribution. And then, if they don't pay, at least you're as prepared as you possibly can be, and you're in the best possible position. Contractors that do that have this nasty little habit of getting paid. They really, really do. 
I've never lost a trial personally. I've never lost a trial. I had one dismissed, um, but I've never lost. Data will always win. You just have to be committed to, to have an either yourself, which I would not recommend because most people aren't qualified for it, but a person like Ken to do it, and then somebody to manage the custodial parts of those technical reports, like a PA or an attorney. And here, I'm going to offend you. You shouldn't be necessary, Penny. If everybody behaved as an adjuster, um, I was an adjuster for years in the 90s. I didn't have one single file that ever went to a PA or ever went to litigation. Almost every file goes to a PA in litigation unless you're doing three days of grind. All right, you shouldn't be necessary if everybody was showing up that was educated and operated in good faith. But that's simply not our environment. I wish yeah. it was, but it's not. So yeah. that's a really long answer. Again, shame on me. I got, I got my soapbox. Ken, you know, just tell me go my soapbox, dude. Yes. David, <laughs> David, no worries. Um, I think we're all enjoying and and you know when I look back at me being a, P a PIA, a public adjuster for six plus years, and then going out on my own, I went down to Ken, uh, to uh, to um, Cal Spoon, and I took his week class and really changed the dynamic. Where the biggest focus that he pushed me, you know, fo focused on us is documentation, documentation, and documentation as the key role that we keep needing to look at no matter how many times. I've really learned a lot from Cal Spoon and now doing it myself for a year and a half, two years. I'm, I'm in, this, in the business now for basically eight years and the dynamics have truly changed. Um, I wanna take the opportunity now to really open up the, the floor to either Victor or Mortify and, and see what, um, what questions they may have to join us and, and ask. So um, while they're thinking of that, Penny, um, I, David and I have known each other for, geez, what is it, David? It was the year 2000. 20, 25 years. Yeah, yeah, something like that. We've known each other forever. And one of the things that we do in all of our talks is that, you know, we keep each other straight. Um, when we're talking on a, in a setting like this, it's very easy for us to say things and go, technically, it's not quite correct, but it came out anyways. And David probably doesn't even know he said David this. Made I know a boo -boo. He knows better. That's, that's he, the prerequisite for it. <laughs> I know. So here, here it comes, David. You, you, you let a little slip out. And, and I really think it's an important okay. distinction here. Okay. And it, you said something very innocently and it just kind of came out. You said that humidity, when it evaporates, can carry contaminants to other locations. And now, if you had an air mover blowing over liquid, yes, you're right. Contaminants can be carried in tiny droplets and be spread throughout the house. But humidity itself is a single H2O molecule. It is like, like a billion times smaller than, a piece, than one bacteria. There's no way humidity can carry something so large as a bacteria's uh, uh, spore to another place in, in the structure. So humidity itself is not a transport mechanism, but water droplets are. So um, I just wanted to make sure that nobody thought that. Here's the danger. If a homeowner believes that when water comes into her house, the water evaporates and spreads contaminants throughout the house, they want a new house. And that doesn't actually happen that way. So that's, that's uh, why it's an important understanding. Humidity doesn't carry contaminants. And, and here's the here's the challenge of, of things like this. If I'm too technical, people accuse me of having a propeller. If I'm not technical enough, can chastise me. Can, I, can no, you're right. I, we okay. We're the two propeller heads <laughs> in the room. Okay, That's, we live, eat, we and are. breathe that kind of science. But, but it is important, guys. Can I tell you that it's just little nuance of stuff that makes all the difference in the world and the science behind it and what you do. You know, I've thought about renaming my school from MIT classes, MIT training to, it depends. It depends training, because <laughs> everything depends on little bitty nuance like this. The, the takeaway on top of Ken's comment is that I want you to consider that most structures are damaged long before you get there. It's your failure to quantify those environments beyond the areas that are just directly physically wet. Great, I have water here. Great, what about out here? 
did, did the plumber come and tear out the drywall or open up a port into or place that valve before you got there? And when he did, did the air conditioner take in, pressurize the room, and cross-contaminate, pull that airstream back to the return like it's supposed to, and distribute it through the house? If you don't sample up front, here's your risk. Maybe someone will catch you. Maybe someone won't. If someone does and the structure is cross-contaminated, guys, don't think it's going to be long before a carrier starts asking you for your baseline sampling. The same carrier that will argue with you that it's not necessary and tell you that it won't be paid will be required once it gets to anything beyond that line level adjuster. And if you don't have it, you will park a great big question mark where you could have parked facts that said, oh, and by the way, it, yes, it's this room. It, it is category three. We have our initial categorization via ATP. We pulled our bacterial sample. We pulled air samples following up on that. Here's our moisture mapping, but the air didn't stay there. So we checked our contents in the adjacent rooms. All right, and we found it was in there. And we looked at our walk paths and patterns and found that they tracked it throughout the house. I do a little illustration in class called Fun with Dick and Jane, where Dick and Jane have a little fight, run around the house and track the poopy water that happens when Dick gets upset and shoves her little, her little plush toy into the toilet, takes a little dookie on it, and then walks and runs away. <laughs> so we cross-contaminate houses from the stuff that happens outside of you being able to know it's there. You want to be responsible for it because I promise once you take care, custody, and control, bar. And now you're arguing forever. Not only that, but you haven't found the whole of your loss. Are you doing five grand a loss on a five thousand dollar job, or is your lack of technical competence and inspection skill making you do five grand of work on fifteen, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars of loss? And are you leaving your client with it because you just don't know some basic stuff? And Ken, you've been an instructor for forever. The kind of stuff that we teach is it routinely covered in WRT and ASD or even in commercial drawing. That's true. It's really hard to understand you, David. Your your earpiece is lousy. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it is. This is a subject that we've been teaching for years. And if uh, I know Victor is here and Mordecai. Um, you know, they, they probably have uh, their IICRC education. And if you had a good instructor, they, you know, reviewed the importance of safety on all your job sites and what, you know, the sequence of events should be and, you know, what a moisture map is and what it's supposed to include and why we collect it and how we're supposed to interpret it. Uh, you'll, and depending on the quality of your instructor, you, you'll get different um, uh, direction in how to interpret the data. It's not always accurate. Some of these instructors no. teach ideas that are purely unscientific and not supportable and very easy to uh, debate. Um, uh, and will kill you at trial. Yeah. It, you, if you don't They'll understand kill you the real science, kill you in trial. Yeah, you got to have good science in order to survive this, the, the scrutiny and criticisms of opposing experts. And I hate to say it, but people like David and I, you know, because we really have we spent our entire careers studying this subject. And it's astonishing how much junk science is taught in our classrooms because the instructors are, you know, they received information that they thought, oh, that makes sense in my head. I'm going to echo it to my students. And sadly, a lot of these ideas are pure junk. Now, I, it, it, I don't want to identify all the ones that I know of. I'm looking forward to hearing from questions from Victor and Mordecai on this call and see if we can uh, identify some understandings that they would have been given in a classroom that might have room for improvement. Uh, Mordecai, do you have any questions? Um, if you do, just raise your hand or unmute yourself. I know Victor does not have a mic with him. Um, but uh, you know, I, I don't really wanna cover the specific safety concerns with OSHA because I think that's really um, a specialty that we're not going to get, get in right now. I do have hopefully some other people that will bring along. Um, but I think what we've Ready? touched on, yes, go ahead. Can I give you an example of a real world application? Sure. A quick one. I have an expert project I'm putting an opinion on to get ready to go to trial. The 
the TPC review doesn't want to pay for the attic as a confined space, nor is a permit confined space, nor um, did, and if you guys don't know how to do this, contact me. I, I can teach you how to do it. I adjusted the work rest ratios per, uh, per OSHA based upon the conditions in the actual attic, okay? Attics are hot. Attics have wet bulb temperatures that routinely wander into the range that if you're working inside of the Tyvek suit would require you to begin to not do continuous work, but to do west work breaks, 75, 25, 50, 50, 25, 75, right? So I have no problem believing that the contractor did work in those areas where that was required. He was responsible, he put his people in full PPE and we made that adjustment. So here's the rub. If this contractor who uses a remote monitoring system, all right, had put a sensor up in the attic, or if he'd taken one of those sensors that he possesses and dropped it inside someone's suit, even better, he could have quantified the necessity of those work break times with real data. If he could have done that, if he could establish either of those environments, there would have been no reason to argue that it was not only a confined space, but a permit required confined space. And you would have no issue quantifying, or I would have no issue quantifying, the legitimacy of the almost doubling of the unit costs associated with the adjustment and exactimate for the labor efficiency for the, for the supporting events. That one piece of information rippled all the way through the requirements to quantify confined space to create the heat hazard that makes it permit required, all right? And that affects the fact that he took twice as long working up in it to remove the insulation and do a type of vacuuming and all of his sanding and that kind of stuff. All of that came from one missing data point that could have been collected in a variety of different ways. You think that OSHA is, is not important. Now, let me flip that to the OSHA side. Your people are working that environment and you're not giving them work rest breaks and one of them stroked out, you're going to harm your employee and they're going to sue you and they should because it's your job to prevent, to detect, monitor and prevent these environments. Okay. You have to know this as a responsible contractor. If you happen to run a silicon blasting company, you would know this. You'd monitor this. If you had welders, you'd know and you'd monitor this and you'd make account for it. For some reason, we in the restoration industry, we just we lose all connection with the rest of 1910 and 1926 in the construction industry. We forget it even exists. So this is a really basic, tiny little piece of information that probably has Fifty to seventy-five thousand dollars of effect on this file. One piece of data. David, may I suggest that you go back to this company and have a conversation um, with who it was that was out there and find out if maybe they have an Apple Watch because you may even have data that you don't even realize because we don't even realize that the guy may actually have on it. Wow. So if he has an Apple Watch, he may know the temperature he was sitting in. I've never thought. I will check that. Never thought of that. That's an interesting angle. And then, David, you can compare the grains per pound outside the house during that day, yep. and then uh, bring that grains per pound into the attic because the GPP would probably yep. be the same. But at least you could establish what the temperature was in the attic, and from that you can derive the relative humidity. And then, with yep. both the temperature and RH, you can figure out the wet bulb global yep. temperature. And then you can apply that to the OSHA threshold and figure out what their rest schedule was. So, and by the way, in Ken's book, this is page 59 <laughs> in, in my Ken's book. book. There if you, you go. don't have Ken's book, guys, you need Ken's book. I'm not, I'm not pitching it to, to make Ken rich, although we should all make Ken rich oh. um, because Ken served the industry <laughs> selflessly for years. Uh, but more than that, it's that kind of data. You, you feel helpless because Nobody's ever taught you the data to collect to make you powerful. You'd be amazed at how powerful you are if you understand the right 
data. And can I tell you that you will not generally learn that in a, in a WRT and an ASB class, not because they're terrible, but because that's not the learning objective in those classes. Right. All right. Their learning objectives are entirely different. You're going to have to come to, you know, a standards class and functional competence class like mine, or to a. Ken and I are getting ready to do a symposium we've discussed about here on documentation several times. Um, yes, I'm re-volunteering. You can. Um, you know, there's there's places where you learn stuff like this, and you don't realize that you not collecting is usually baked in by you not grabbing data and information in a third party validated way and distributed it the way you're supposed to. Just, you just are at the end of the day. Ken's reports will hold up. I promise you they will. We, we've, um, we're headed off the trial in a couple right now. Right. You can't do what Ken can do. You can start it. You can make sure that you have a reasonable predicate for getting Ken on the job. But somebody like Ken on a project, and no, not just commercial. Guys, it applies to residential as well. We have LOIs from OSHA that are super clear that although the, the federal regs are, are written for commercial, they apply for everything, which does, of course, include institutional and residential work. Just because you're on a house doesn't mean you get to kill your people, you know, either by making them stroke out in a hot attic or by killing them with silicosis or mesothelioma 20, 25 years, although silicosis is usually only five or six do we have any good questions? Since, uh, and I'm going to get back off my soapbox. David I said it was um, quick, and I lied again. David, as you know, looking back, just remember that when you're looking at the Apple Watch, Apple's not the only option out there. There may be a few other op options out there. So basically, go through the team, um, and also remember that sometimes the phones themselves uh, can calculate uh, the the temperatures. So once again, I don't know the specifics, and you'll have to dig into it yourself as to what you may be able to pull up in that direction. Um, and then also- well, I do confirm, have access. I'm sorry. Go ahead. And also I, confirm timestamp. Whatever you are going to pull up, just a reminder to confirm timestamp of location to make sure that all aligned so there's no questions asked. In other words, it may be aligned with their phone timestamp of, of their locate, uh, GPS location. So that- you know, we have access works. to a personnel monitor that okay. will grab the GPS location and temp and RH. So we can use it outside of a suit for that. You can also use it inside of a suit to monitor that, which is, by the way, much better. Oh, yeah. That reading inside of that suit is the actual reading at the, the point and in the environment that the employee is engaging. Um, and uh, I think it's far better. So I'd like to go uh, and just take a second to explain to the audience uh, what we're talking about. I have a funny feeling that this, they, they might not understand what uh, we're speaking of when we speak of this work rest uh, time frame. Um, so David was talking about working in an attic. As we all know, working in an attic is hard labor because you're crawling around in between the trusses and it's very hot up there. Of course, OSHA is gonna have some thoughts on, you know, your workers working in that kind of environment and it must they must be given a safe place to work so when it gets super hot like that osha has published a heat stress table uh, you know saying if your guys are going to be working in this environment this temperature and that relative humidity they can work continuously for a whole hour if it's under a certain level if it goes over that level, they're going to start reducing the amount of time you can work in that chamber before you need to take a rest. All right. And that's what the, we're speaking of. And so the thresholds that OSHA has published is they said, under certain conditions, you have to give your guys a 15 minute break every hour. If it gets even warmer or more humid, they can only work 30 minutes every hour. They have to give them a 30 minute break. If it gets even hotter or more humid, it can even get to the point where they can only work 15 minutes an hour, and then you have to give them a 45 minute break. Now, of course, the insurance company is gonna lose their mind if your guys are only putting in 15 minutes of work every hour and then taking a 45 minute break, right? What this does, the opportunity that was missed by the contractor was this. If they didn't have that one reading, like David said, that one reading, give me a temperature and an RH reading in that attic. In the absence of that, 
they can't justify the necessity to install a portable air conditioner in that attic. They won't want to pay for it. They'll just sit there and say, why did you do that? We're not paying for that. I don't care about your guy's comfort. Well, if you have the environmental condition of the attic, you can say, in order to prevent a condition that would only allow me to let my guys work 15 minutes an hour, I installed this $100 or $200 air conditioner in the attic so they could work a continuous hour. And now the contractor gets paid for that without dispute because they had the data. All right, and that's what we're talking about is the importance of collecting the right data up front so as to justify why your bill is thirty or forty thousand dollars when they were expecting a three or five thousand dollar job because the other contractors don't understand or were not aware of the opportunity that was missed. That's I an obligation. It's not an opportunity. Obligation. It's an obligation. They were supposed to do it that way, and they didn't do it that way, and they. You know, violated the law really exposed. I want to remind the audience that the IRCRC clearly says in the dynamics that they have you have to document these these things, and a lot of people forget that the IRCRC clearly says in it to document the, me the and measure the different temperatures, the different controls, the different humidity, and so many people forget what the IRCRC. A lot of people doing the job, learned it once, and never look back. Right. And that's something that cannot be done when we're dealing with something like this, because besides the fact that IICRC gets updated, um, by documenting and keeping these variables facts, you know, these facts, we're now able to charge for it. And a lot of people I'm in conversation, you know, with a mitigation company, and they're like, well, we do our building this way. I'm like, why don't you charge for this? Why don't you charge for that? The IICRC says you have to do that. You're not sure about it being included? Well, then look back in your exact bit, look back in the definition of something and see if it's included. Because half the time, the, the definition clearly says, well, this includes this, and it misses out on half the other things that the IICRC is, says is required to complement this job. And therefore, you're just not billing accurately. And will you negotiate with the insurance company and maybe you, you'll you'll accept less? That's your discretion. But this is something that you have a right to bill for because that's what the IICRC tells you to do. And that is the guidelines you have to do. And you have to keep up with OSHA. OSHA has a requirement for you to do X, Y, and Z. Therefore, you don't have the choice. You have to do this. And if you're telling, you know, if the insurance company tells you, well, we're not going to pay you for this, you're basically turning around and saying, are you telling me that you're not going to pay us to do OSHA? Hmm. Perfect. Please give and it to me in writing. Let me give you the he said, she said part. Contractor says, you mean you're not, you're not charging me for it? Imagine if you as a consumer, and the carriers are, in essence, consumers, right? Imagine if somebody came out to your structure they expect you to mow the yard and be done with it. You turn them in a bill that's for 10 times more because you didn't, they didn't tell you that, you didn't tell them there were sticks and there were rocks and there were boulders. And oh, by the way, you had three broken lines that I had to fix in your irrigation and this and this and this. You'd be really, really upset when you got that great big bill. And you'd feel ambushed at the end of the day. Our failure to communicate up front what it is that we're supposed to be doing and why. If you do not give them a narrative, if you don't create a narrative, they will create their own. You want their narrative to at least be challenged and informed by your set of facts. If you don't do that, they're going to feel ambushed. If they're going to have a problem, for God's sakes, give it to them up front. I need to do this because of this. You got an opinion on that? Because if I don't hear back from you in the 24 hours, I'm going to assume you've read this and understand it. And yes, I put, did put my read and delivery receipts on. So I want to know you got it. All right, this is what we need to do. This is why we're going to do it. You won't necessarily mean they won't fight, but I'll tell you when every single time if you noticed. Um, we, we wait to the end, and then we're surprised why they're pissed off. Because on the other side of this, these adjusters have metrics to meet. And every time you do your job right, you are by definition blowing up their metrics. Your, your loss severity is off. They're 
production amount is off, the way that they, they adjust the loss down or reconcile the loss for accuracy is off, you screw up every one of their metrics on the backside. Now, that's not your fault. That's an industry as a whole that's uninformed using metrics that don't reflect reality, which, by the way, is, again, whose fault? Us. You. We did that by not doing our job, not documenting, by not being the professional up front, by not telling them up front what we need to do and explaining to them why, in no uncertain terms, this needs to be done, and here's your notice. We fall into this, and we self-perpetuate it. Don't get me wrong, plenty of blame to go around, but we absolutely participate in this at the end of the day. And, and by the way, can I say, stop acting like a beat whipped puppy asking for permission. You were the professional on the project can't make anybody do anything, but you can darn straight stand up as a professional and provide them your professional experience, your knowledge, your understanding, and your sights and everything. So at the end of the day, you should be in pretty decent shape to do this if you will run and rule and control the narrative. If you don't, don't be surprised if you're in the same position as every time. You know how to get there. The question is, can you wind up in a better spot? And I'm going to tell you, if you're doing what we suggest, you're going to wind up in a much better spot. You may still wind up in a dispute that's going to be over a much larger, more accurate bill, and you're going to be a whole lot farther down the road to having it paid. You will have done the right thing. So. David, I want to take the opportunity to continue down our list. We kind of revisited. Um, the next one was really moisture mapping and sampling. Um, I, want, I want to start, start touching based on that. I mean, most people come in using moisture meter identify. Uh, my understanding really is to identify the full dynamics and uh, what I was reading in the IICRC this morning is it clearly tells you uh, clearly that, well, we have water in this room. You're very likely to have water in the next room, even if you don't, if, if you don't see it, if you don't physically see it. And it takes, it, it clearly tells you to use not just moisture readings, but to actually use, um, use the infrared camera to attempt to identify additional moisture um, and then confirm it with the moisture. What was that? I said Ken just twitched. Ken just twitched. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I was just on a, um, uh, I'm sorry. I, I just got, was cleaning something up here that distracted me. I apologize. See the moisture moved along <laughs> into the other end of the house. Um, uh, it so does say that you, you can use you. thermal imaging. Yes. But it does say if you use it, you must validate it, verify it with an actual moisture meter. That's right. And yeah. by the way, I just had somebody that had had to settle 10 grand off of their off of their bill because they didn't bother to send their person to a school to quantify. I'm I'm a level three certified thermographer. I have been for 20 years. I have a I have a thermal imaging camera that costs half as much as my house when I bought it back in the late 80s. Early or early 90s. Um, him not having that means he couldn't prove competence. Certifications, if you aren't competent, don't mean anything. Certifications, if you are competent, um, are kind of your key and entry point and it eliminates your question of competence more often than not. Not that it should. Lots of people operating thermal imaging cameras with training that do it wrong. But if you don't have that training, I can promise you it will become a point of negotiation and you will give when it is. And then the question is, do you really know how to use your thermal imaging camera? If I talk to you about level span and emissivity, do you understand what that means? Do you understand how to adjust it for the building materials? You start hanging your hat on the effectiveness of what these things are, not that just it, did it go white or did it go dark blue. All right. Try that in a deposition. <laughs> Watch the attorney salivate and pass out from the excitement. <laughs> but this is what lots and lots of people do. So you know, make sure you're functionally competent, trained on your equipment. It's not like there's not abundant training out there. So what I'm hearing from you is that day one, that first person that comes in and does the moisture evaluation should be somebody who's certified to do whatever certifications required on moisture mapping and identify the moisture before mitigation begins, before anything else begins, have somebody come in to do moisture mapping. Absolutely. So um, if you can't validate it with data, guys, it just never happened. Why do you think insurance companies, and this is reasonable, by the way, from their perspective, why do you think they want to argue with you about your meter? 
what setting it was on. Did you calibrate it? You don't have a meter calibration program called Kenneri. I teach this as part of my standards class. Every single project has a meter calibrated on and a meter calibrated off, as well as the thermal hygrometer. Nobody thinks to calibrate the thermal hygrometers. If you can blow up your equilibrium moisture content and your atmospheric readings, that means your dehumidifiers can't be validated. All this stuff becomes a matter of interpretation and opinion rather than fact. You think you collected facts. What you really did is you just collected a group of a, a body of knowledge that someone's going to beat you with later on. Um, it, you have to do this properly, and I don't think as an industry this is really getting. Sorry about that. I don't think it's getting taught any place. Ken, are you, are you aware of any place this is really getting hammered? Well, well it, only in the IICRC courses do they cover the necessity of what readings, at a minimum, you're supposed to collect every single day on your inspections. But my problem is this. I, I would anticipate that your listeners are sitting here listening to us and going, you guys are nuts. I mean, if you think we're going to go out there and get our meters verified to be calibrated and we're going to, I mean, these are 18 year old kids. They just got out. Of, I can barely get them to show up at work. You think I'm going to be able to get them to, you know, take proper readings and, you know, and then furthermore, I give these readings to the insurance company and they say, that you can get compensated $45 per day per visit. $45 for all this scientific stuff that, you know, that nobody in, you know, their company uh, is stepping up to interpret all these readings and make these adjustments and write a narrative on how and why we change things and who said what and, you know, and on and on it goes. Nobody, the, the compensation isn't made available from the insurance carriers for that level of, of attention. And when you do give them the data, what do they do? They say, wait a minute, who was it that collected that sample? Oh, the 18 year old kid? What kind of education does he have? You know, he's, you can barely, you know, keep them around, let alone give them enough time to go get their IICRC de designations. And so there's all these roadblocks. And so the answer is really quite simple for your listeners. I suggest that the contractor tell uh, the, uh, either the, their customer, the policyholder, or the insurance carrier on, right up front, we do not provide that documentation. Don't do it. And they're going to say, well, we have to have it. Otherwise, we can't pay you. They say, I know. And that's why I encourage the policyholder to engage a third party to do this documentation. And that way they can submit an invoice to the policyholder for the competent use of $30,000 worth of meters and the interpretation of the data in a formal report with their insurance you know, for errors and omissions in the production of that report. And that it is expertly crafted with carefully worded language that outlines what the, the interpretation is of all this data. And then when they submit the, that report to the policyholder, not the contractor, to the policyholder, this report belongs to the policyholder. The policyholder will then submit that if they want to the contractor for his records. Thank you very much, the contractor says. I've got my data all you know, nicely prepared. Um, and the homeowner can give it to the insurance company saying, this is an element of my claim. I would like to be indemnified for this. Make me whole. Pay the bill for that third-party consultant. And the of course, the insurance company is going to go crazy. Well, like, why did you hire this third-party indoor environmental professional, that IEP? And the answer is because it's said over and over and over again in the standard that that is standard practice. And secondly, why do you think I would trust the contractor? He's conflicted. Of course, he's going to say it's wet. And when he feels that he's got made enough money, he's going to say, of course, it's dry. Why would you trust him? Would you trust him, Mr. Insurance Company? And the insurance company says, we don't trust contractors. Well, neither do I. And that's why I had an expert verify that this contractor did it right. Man, isn't that the, a better solution? And it's easily justifiable. And it complete, it, not completely, it reduces the... Uh, liability carried by the contractor because he's standing 
He's got an expert standing beside him. Now, the one thing that you're going to have to be prepared for as a, as a contractor is that that expert might be whispering in your ear, you know what, you should change this. This isn't right. You know, it's going to be really hard to justify what you're doing over there. I'd suggest you do this, this, and this. Now, if you're smart, you're going to take him up on that and you're going to make the correction so that you have his support on everything that was done on the job. But at the end of the day, it's your job, Mr. Contractor. You can do whatever you want in your job. If you've got a good expert, he's going to be saying, oh, let's just do a couple of tweaks and that'd be even better. That's, that's going to be the adjustment in, your, in uh, the way you go about your claim. It's important that you listen to them. So what I'm hearing is really a third party, um, which I think the IICRC brings down, um, using a third party to really identify uh, where that moisture is and, and what's, you know, what should right. be done, which yep. really then clarifies the whole dynamic, which then clears up, well, this is what has to be done. And the contractor goes ahead and does that job properly because they're listening to the report of the third party. Um, and, and this is... This is why so many people have to get involved. But at the end of the day, we're following the standards set, the standards set forth by the IICRC, um, which really clears that up. And, and we can go on and on about how to do testing, whether we're going to use three and a half inch screws, whether we're going to use what type of moisture meter. The you know, at the end of the day, that's not this is not the class for that. But but we do we did clarify very much. Um, how to do go about that? Um, we could go ahead and and, and discuss the, uh, the the three and a half inch screws, for example, which we kind of I kind of touched base with David in the past. Um, and my understanding is that at the end of the day, the center of the beam, the center of that seal plate, is what we're really looking at with the three inch screws. So we can identify areas that are that are wet by using simple moisture meters at the beginning. But to confirm dryness, we really have to dig, use more, inten more intensive um, and more invasive forms, such as three and a half inch screws, um, you know, where a hammer moisture meter may only penetrate an inch in, where the three and a half inch screws can actually get into the center of the beam and really change how things are looked at. Um, is that an accurate statement of those, of what I laid out? Oh. So it's my turn to uh, you know speak a little bit on this one. Um, David and I have spent not hours, not days, but probably months talking about this subject. Okay, <laughs> about the use of screws in two by fours and detecting the highest level of moisture throughout the span of that two by four. If the water is deep in the core, the question is: Is that a risk to? the outside of the uh, wood actually, you know, becoming moldy or supporting mi microbial growth of some sort. And this is the eternal debate, okay? Because in the center of the wood, there is unlikely to be any mold spore. It's in the center of the tree. Why do we think there's a seed in there, a mold spore that can germinate? So the, it's <clears throat> logical to conclude that the spores are on the outside of the wood. So if the core of the wood has got the water content that the, um, that the spore is looking for in order to germinate, once that water migrates and the, throughout the wood and it becomes equally wet, is there now enough moisture present to cause that mold spore on the surface of the wood to germinate and grow? And there's the speculation, there's the big old question mark, how dry does it have to be throughout the span of that piece of timber in order for it not to be a risk to the, uh, the, the function and health of that uh, building component. And it's, it's, an, it, it's an ongoing discussion. There is no um, actual threshold. Uh, I think it's healthy that David knows that the center of that wood is saturated and way high reading. The question is, how much of that core is actually wet? And if it did equalize throughout the span of that piece of timber, what would be the eventual equilibrium moisture content throughout the entire piece of wood if that core just uh, spread out its moisture and there was no humidity or moisture gradient throughout the span of that, that timber? 
Um, there's no magic number on this. All we know is that um, we are hired to return the structure to a healthy moisture content, something that represents normal and acceptable. And that would include, in my mind, the installation of the material. I, for instance, if sheetrock is mounted on that sheet on that two by four, the wet two by four will expand dimensionally, which could compromise the installation of the sheetrock on that material. You might get a nail pop. Maybe there's going to be some of that uh, joint compound or the tape that they use on the sheetrock. Maybe that'll blister or somehow uh, it'll uh, move. The two sheets go like this and the tape is, uh, is off, you know, it doesn't work correctly. So there could be a compromise to the installation. What I resist viciously is a claims reviewer who says, as long as the wood can't support mold growth, that's all you need to accomplish. That is not in the standard, that is not responsible. It is not a complete view of our objectives. And it not is, a, uh, yeah, it's not pre-loss, it's a mistake all across the board. So I reject con uh, all reviewers who say, as long as it's below the threshold that can support mold, it's good enough. That's easy to defeat. David and I can eat that up all day long, all right? And, there, the, and the opposing opinion is clearly wrong and we can use the standard to prove it as well as the US Department of Forestry to prove it. It's wrong. And um, if you are struggling with people who debate that subject, that's when you need to align yourself with experts that can stand beside you and defend your position. It doesn't have to be David, it doesn't have to be me. There are other experts in the industry that are prepared to take that discussion on. You should have that expert at your availability whenever needed. Thank you. Thank you, Ken and David, for bringing it back to myself of pre loss condition, you know, which is my strong point, which is, you know, at the end of the day, if we're not in pre-loss condition, we've not indemnified the client. And that's something that is continuously argued upon. And you know, I, I, I've come before I knew you guys, I was dealing with claims where, where the, the insurance company said, well, we don't have to open the wall, it's dry already. And I'm like, that's not indemnification, that's not pre-loss condition. And now my, my additional viewpoint of understanding of those dryness is, not just that, just look back at the IRCRC you know, and guidelines that clearly says, well, the drying doesn't begin until I've ripped it all out. So with play, the fact that it's wet, I now have to open up because the cavity behind there is not clean. And pre-loss condition was a clean cavity behind there. That way, I don't have any bleeding in later of all the, the, the contaminants or any dirtiness that may happen if, every, if once again, there's wetness involved. Um, and then what's going to happen with that moisture that's going to pop out, et cetera. But going ahead and getting sometimes, yes, going ahead and taking a, th a three and a half inch screw and drilling it in there to get the reading changes the dynamics um, even a week later because, yeah, your moisture reader is not, your moisture reader is not going to show me nothing. But the reality is that center of that thing is not, has not, the center of the seal plate, that center of that two by four has not been returned to that pre loss condition, and it makes a tremendous difference to the claim. Right. The greatest so, issue is the, the kind of metering technology that's used. Because if you understand how relative, uh, relative readers are used, whether they're radio frequency like the General Electric or now Amphorol series R, or their impedance like the Tramex, or a, uh, I guess it's also probably also include uh, X-Tech in that, which is now clear as impedance. They take the average readings at the depth of their read and they're stopped by liquid or by uh, any kind of air break or insulating break, which air is. So in between your trim and your drywall, once you no longer have liquid phase or unbound water in there, you got a gap. Same thing between your drywall and your piece of trim. So it's averaging that reading. So understanding how your meters work make a big difference on whether or not you even know if you have a piece of material that could be at risk. Um, we just happened to be in an event with Joe Stiebrick and um, he has a publication out if you don't own it. I, I think you should. Um, you happen to have that handy, Ken? I bet he yeah. does because we both keep it on our desks. There you go. 
moisture control for build uh, for building and residential buildings. Right. What's interesting about this is that he identifies that any material that hits 28% moisture content, which is fiber saturation or above, once it hits that, it triggers rot inside of that wood that will tend to operate down to at least 20%. Now, if you never get to 28, for some reason that rot doesn't seem to empirically end up being an issue within your wood. And if you think this is esoteric, then you lack the inquisitiveness to be drying structures, guys, because that's mostly what we dry. Those class two losses are not class two losses. Go look at the definition of class four in low evaporative materials and assemblies. And you won't find out you hardly ever do it too. So um, the, the big issue with, with the maximum level of moisture in a material, which is what your screw will give you across the depth of its actual material surveyed, and the relative reading, number one, makes a big difference in what you're dealing with. And the, the thing that Ken and I keep talking about, and I'm working with, uh, with Dr. Phil Mitchell at North Carolina State on a way to be able to calculate this, the water that's left in that piece of wood, and you close it back up in a wall assembly, and you paint it with impermeable paint, and you caulk it in with an impermeable caulk, where does that water go? that water goes someplace inside of that wall cavity or assembly or from the wood to the drywall that's right next to it and can it support microbial amplification completely different than your conversation penny i'm going to put back on my adjuster hat now completely different from pre-loss equilibrium moisture content or standard operating conditions dry standard in a building which you can find using the wood forestry chart if you want to so we have a couple of different conversations, this kid and I being propeller headed about how wet can you leave it? Our goal is just so you know, never how wet can we leave it? Our goal should be based on the standard and based on the policy to return it back to its pre-loss content. But there is, a, you know, we have to be academically honest and say there's some fudge. Can I leave it at 13% moisture EMC with my screws and predictably not be able, and I predictably is the important word, Macro mold inside of my wall cavity. And our real problem is, is we don't know. Because if you use your non penetrating meter, you could have a saturated piece of wood in between those two wall sections. All right. And you would never know it because you didn't, you didn't sample the depth of the wall. Now, if you use screws and it's 13% in the middle, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But Ken and I can screw around with the psychometrics and create a water activity that could support microbial growth. All right. Or we can't, and this is this is a real problem. It's very easy for the other side to say once it gets below 20% or once it gets below 16%, it won't grow mold and therefore we're done. Well, that's not the point. What was dry standard? And did you actually find all the water that's in there? And how wet can you, how wet are you as a contractor willing to leave it knowing that you can't quantify what that final condition inside of that wall cavity is? if you don't dry the material. And is 14% enough? 13 is 15? There are circumstances that 16 might be fine. 15.9 could be fine. But you don't know, you can't tell, which is why the standard, I think, when they wrote it, didn't focus on how wet we could leave it, but instead focused on its normal operating condition it's pre-loss moisture content in the execution of that. So all of you that fight this, and if you're doing reviews with TPAs and, and peer reviewers, you've heard this before. I want you to know where they're coming from so you have some idea of why it is completely reasonable to do what we're suggesting for you to do. It's not our job to play roulette with, did I leave it wet enough to cause damage or harm to my client? And that's what you do. If you don't get it back to its original pre-loss moisture content or within your acceptable region, which is 2% per the standard, 20% off the number, right? Which is generally around 10, so that's why I said two. If you don't do that, you're left yourself. You left everybody open for all kinds of litigation. Someone will park, someone will park an opinion for you should have put your fact. <laughs> and then we'll have the problem all over again. Um, that's why these little details of what kind of meters you use and how you moisture map, and did you find everything that's really actually there? That's why this becomes so 
so important. It's critical. And it's not just critical in ours because we're nerdy and technical and we get into all kinds of trouble. Um, we get in all kinds of trouble because we're doing more than we need to do. I've had people say that before. David, you're constantly in trouble because because you're doing more work than everyone else. Well, how about you're probably in trouble because you've done less work than needs to be done. You just haven't been caught for it yet. Well, I don't know. Which one are you? I don't know. You probably should consider that at the end of the day. So anyway, 5000 on a 5000 job, $5,000 on a $40,000 job. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's it, it's a major difference and and yeah. too many people are just not looking at the full job and i mean that's why i was very specific when i dealt with certain jobs where where i'm bringing in the right team and now we brought in all state restoration over here in, in, in our job and it's really changed the dynamics because i was introduced to them and they introduced me to you guys and it really changes the dynamics of how we look at the plane because we're making sure that everything is properly doc documented and all the, you know, everything is aligned. And then it's an easy uh, result of making sure that everything is documented. So there's nothing to discuss. And, and you guys saw the email. I, I included you in my response uh, yesterday where I responded back to the adjuster, to the insurance adjuster. And, you know, he's got some questions and I'm like, no problem. Go ahead and give me all the answers, all the questions you want, because <laughs> I know between the two of you, I'll have all my answers. So that yeah, really. It seems to be the trend is that contractors today are realizing that unless they had surround themselves with experts, they usually are subjected to some really unfair um, claim settlement practices uh, where they demand um, unreasonable concessions to the invoice simply because they know. Uh, I bet you they don't have the data. Uh, I bet you they, they just don't have this little bit of understanding. I can get them on that one. Oh, yeah. And, um, you know, it, and it's not fair. It, you know, they know that they're taking advantage of a, a situation and it results in lower loss severity. And at the end of the day, I guess that's what they're hired to find a way to produce. And so if you surround yourself with experts, they're going to have a more difficult time with that. His questions to to me specifically were, "Why am I using you know certain experts?" And yeah. I'm like, "Go ahead and tell me what what the you know tell me ask away." Yeah. Um, but yeah, we, we, we're going to because we had a, that one. the answer to that um, that adjuster would be because we had questions that needed an answer, and you have the same questions, Mister Adjuster. In fact, you're asking, "Why did we have to bring in experts?" Well, because without these experts. <laughs> You know, we, we can't answer the questions. Everybody's just guessing. And so, um, you know, that's why it's a it's not an uncommon practice to bring in uh, uh, well-educated experts to um, uh, establish consensus before the work is done. This is a big missing part in our industry is that contractors go in there, they do all this work, and then they argue about what they did after the job is done. Boy, that's a really, really poor position to be in. Um, on the other hand, if you start the job with a series of experts that said, this is the way we all think it should be done, and let's establish that this is acceptable right now before we do the work, that's a much stronger position to be in for the end of that job, because you can now say, hey, we discussed it, we identified these issues, these are the people that all agreed, this is the direction we're we should go in. So your, their debate after the work is done is now untimely, because they're too late for that discussion. We opened up this discussion before the work was done, and we all agreed on it, here's the bill as agreed. And that's also part of the good documentation is that you establish who agreed to what and when, and then you know that becomes binding. Um, I, I want to cover you know it, the, we just covered moisture and mapping and sampling, um, though I know there's a lot more we can converse on that um, classification and categorization. At this point, really, I don't want to go on into because I think that's one of the things that are um, really touched upon as we do the sampling, which is what's going to help go ahead and, and, and direct us for, with, the, with the direction we're going to go. I want to jump straight to stabilization because this is a point that a lot of people 
don't really cover. Um, and I know David really approached this a lot on last call. And I know you've also brought it up in, in, in our conversation the first time. So I want to just basically skim over and go through what has to be done and what the purpose of, uh, of a stabilization is. Ken, you want to take start off? Yeah, sure. So I think um, for the listeners out there, uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if many of you have heard of contractors or mitigators who have an element of their mitigation process called stabilization. And in the standard, there is a section that speaks about stabilization, stabilizing the humidity in a contaminated environment. So if you've got category two or three water, which to be honest with you, will constitute the vast majority of work that you're going to encounter, the really, really rare, rare unicorn out there is a category one loss. And if that surprises you, then you really need to have somebody help you with your establishing of category of water. Because it, there's, it's amazing to me how many contractors are drying projects as if they're category one losses when it is likely that they are not category one. And if you treated a category two or three water loss like a category one, what kind of liability are you carrying? And I will state that a lot of contractors have been put out of business because they didn't categorize the water correctly. They did the scope completely wrong and possibly hurt somebody in the process. That is not a good place to be. All right. So the standards acknowledges that, look, sometimes we're going to have a contaminated loss and you can't, you don't have permission or the ability to proceed right away on doing the mitigation work and getting the contaminated materials out. So it's there's a discussion in the standard about a stabilization phase. And the objective of the stabilization phase is to get the project to a condition, um, I'm, I'm gonna reword the way I state this. Stabilization are all the activities necessary to bring the job to a category one condition all of the activities to bring it to category one. So let's review those. It's your emergency service call. It is your water extraction. It is the blocking and padding of the furniture. It is the erection of containment around that contaminated area and placing it under negative pressure with a uh, air filtration device. So to be clear, that does not mean take your air scrubber and put it in the center of the room. That is not negative pressure. That is neutral. That's an air scrubbing mode. And that is not compliant with the standard. You're supposed to set it up in a way that puts the contaminated area under a vacuum. So you put, you're taking the air from the chamber and exhausting it out the building through the air filtration device. All right. So that's negative. Now, when you do that, you're pulling in outdoor air, aren't you? That means that the, you're gonna be taking air from outside the building. And if you're in Florida or in the deep South in the summertime, you're gonna be drawing in 150 grain air from outside into your chamber. Yikes, right? Yikes. So you're gonna to have to manage that with dehumidification, supplemental dehumidification. And then you set your desired environmental condition to be about 45 to 50 percent relative humidity. Now I'll ask any restorer, if you had 50 percent relative humidity in your drying chamber, do you think that's a good drying chamber? And I would hope that everybody would agree that's a really crappy drying chamber. That's not a very good drying chamber. It's not very dry. Therefore, when we specify that the stabilization strategy is to produce a condition that is 50% RH, it is not drying. And the IICRC initial dehumidifier formulas have nothing to do with this discussion. Don't you bring that formula out. It has nothing to do with stabilization. The, it's the initial drying dehumidification formula, not stabilization. Two completely different objectives, right? You're gonna isolate the HVAC system. You're going to set up, and I, I feel bad, um, David, because I forgot to mention at the very beginning, you got to have a health and safety plan. 
for that job. It's a contaminated environment. You got to put that plan together and it must be OSHA compliant. And if you're, if you don't have guys to do that, you can hire it out. There are people you can find online that will come into your job site and they will draft up your health and safety plan for that job. And that becomes an- And perform your occupant survey. Yep, that's right, with the occupant survey. It becomes an element of the claim because you would not have incurred that cost of a health plan or a health and safety plan if it were not for the fact that there was this contaminated water that came in there. It's an element of the claim. It is not overhead. It is not overhead. I'll say it a third time. These plans is not overhead. You would not have incurred that cost except for the fact that you got that job. Therefore, it's not overhead. All right. Um, and then uh, once you've got it, oh, and then once you've uh, removed the materials that have absorbed that uh, humidity or that, that moisture, that contaminated water, I forgot one more thing. You have to isolate the HVAC system you have to isolate the HVAC because you can't have the air servicing a contaminated environment. It'll put that junk all over the house, right? So you have to isolate the HVAC system. Now you might say, but I live in California. It gets hot down here. It's gonna get way too hot in that chamber because it's got no air conditioning in there, which we agree. It's gonna be uncomfortable there. And if there is going to be the need for occupants to occupy that building and you can't maintain comfortable temperatures uh, in that building, then you might have to bring in portable heaters or portable air conditioners to maintain that environment. Now, all this stuff, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if many listeners are going, what? You have to do that, all that stuff on a two and three? We don't do it that way. I'm going to invite you to ask yourself, why? Why aren't you doing it? Why aren't you delivering a standard job? Why are you do not delivering a standard job? This is standard. What I'm describing is not over standard. It's not excessive. It's not a Rolls Royce treatment. It's standard. And if you're not doing that, ask yourself why you're not giving standard work to your customer. Because people like us say that in the, if you're missing that, then that might be considered substandard. Substandard. Who wants to be told they're doing substandard work? Who's, who goes to work every day and say, and I can't wait to give my customer a substandard product? That's, that's a real disappointment, right? You don't want to do that. We give standard service. Now, think about all the costs of everything I just described. Think of the costs. Now, once you've got to a, a condition where it was verified to now be category one condition, you may now begin drying. Go ahead and get your IIC or C initial dehumidifier formula. Go ahead and get your air movers. Uh, go ahead and take down your containment if you want, although it's not always necessary. The containment can be a nice chamber that you can you know, make a nice smaller room so that you can dry those materials out more effectively. But if you had all the sheetrock cut out that have absorbed that contamination and you took out the insulation and you took out the flooring because of the contamination, and you washed everything down and you scrubbed it and you applied disinfectant and you had a consultant come out there and verify it's now category one. All you're looking at is plywood, two by fours and sheathing. How long do you think it would take you to dry that out? Now, I'm, I'm, I'm inviting you to think about this because I wouldn't be surprised if many of you say, yeah, three to five days, maybe seven days at the outside because I took the sheetrock out. I took out the insulation. I took out the carpet and pad. I just got plywood and two by fours. You might be done in three to five days. But the stabilization effort, all the activities that bring it to a sanitary condition, that might take a week or two. It's very possible. It could take a week or two for all that to happen. And during that time, you had an air scrubber in there the whole time and a dehumidifier the whole time. And, the, and so now you've got 10 days of stabilization and four days of drying. And when they say, we don't want to pay 14 days of drying, you say, why do you think it's all drying? It's not. The first 10 days was just stabilization. It had nothing to do with drying. And in fact, many of the delays, Mr. Adjuster, were you. You said, don't go. Don't proceed. Wait, I got to get some approval. You're the one that held it up. It wasn't us. We begged you to please let us finish the job. 
And you're saying, well, wait, I got to ask somebody else. I got to get a third party peer review. I got to uh, whatever. And, and you're going like, you know, you held it up, Mr. Adjuster. It wasn't me. And he did it on the 10th because I wrote it in my journal. And you did it on the 12th. I wrote it in my journal. And I and you we had this conversation on this phone call at two o'clock on Friday. You held it up. It's not me. And you, surely you don't expect me to do this for free. Right. And so now well, you've got the maybe. conversation, right? <laughs> so um, anyways, what I'm trying to say is that the mitigation phase, my favorite trick for mitigators is you break up the bill and the scope into two completely different phases. Phase one is stabilization. It's all the activities to get it ready for the first day of drying. And you make the Xactimate, if you like Xactimate or Symbility or any of these other software programs that I'm not promoting one over the other, whatever one you use, you make a scope of work for stabilization, phase one of the mitigation for Mrs. Jones. Mrs. Jones, phase one mitigation, stabilization. And you make an invoice for it. That's phase one. And then you create the drying. And that would be a completely separate Xactimate or Symbility or whatever. And a completely separate invoice for the drying phase. You separate them out. 10 days of equipment on the stabilization, four days on the drying, 14 total days of equipment rental, two completely phase, different phases. Don't confuse the two. Don't let the reviewer conflate the two. Don't, they're separate. And that gets you paid with less debate on the, the extended duration that some reviewers say is unacceptable. That, that all makes sense? Anyway, there, there's my little- And if you collect the data for it and you won't be quiet, you'll tell them why professionally it needs to be done. They can't answer professionally because they're not professionals. It may be a claim professional, there's a couple of those left, but they're not technical experts. They, they're not contractors. They're not restoration companies. They're not, general con they're not mitigators, they're not remediators. They don't do infection control. They don't have OSHA backgrounds. Generally, they have none of that. They're the guy that's the administrative control on the severity of the lost payment. And if you fail to tell them why it should be paid for, they will reward you with the, with the, with the payment that deserves. <laughs> if you're okay with that, okay. But most people in general are not, especially once they figure out it's optional. You don't have to do it that way. Right. It's completely optional. Um, we only have a few minutes left. And I know, you know, I wanna go through both. If, I wanna ask you both what those main things are that we should remind ourselves about. But I, I know the first thing is documentation. And I've gonna stress that multiple times. Everything that we've, spoken about today is about documentation, documentation, documentation. It's been, um, it's been phenomenal throughout, you know, whether it's from, you know, speaking to Ken, speaking to David, going back to my initial training after I, you know, after I went off onto my own, where I went to Cal Spoon and he stressed so much from Cal, from Melanie, from, from Sean, uh, you know, they, they, they taught that week nonstop you know, documentation, 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 and just following the simple letter of the law, meaning this is what we learned. And so, so many times we go ahead and do things differently, but the law is the way it is. And if you look back to IICRC is the way it is, you know, there is documents here. There is the, the book. Ken Larson's book is written based on facts. When we look at the facts, everything is aligned with, it, with itself and there's nothing to argue about, you know. It's like I had a fire claim and I went ahead and you know, just stuck with the facts. This is the facts. And then in 92 days, the claim was settled. And two weeks later, we had our check in hand. And it's like, well, the, the just, the actually the attorney told me, well, it's going to take about a week, about a month to get me the check. And I'm like, well, it's not what the law says. So why are we, why am I waiting that long? And within two weeks, we had that check. Um, so it really changes the dynamics. Um, David's, Let's go to you first on this one. Give me, give me something of, of besides documentation, which is a key element. Is there another one thing or, or two things that you would tell us to remember when we look back from when the claim begins 
to when the uh, till you know going through the claim process is there some elements that you would remind us to look at and david take a few more moments to think ken do you have something that you think is <laughs> to point out well that's 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 the biggest wild card i think i've ever heard <laughs> what? I mean, there's a thousand things i want to say um just me being dumbfounded <laughs> uh, yeah um, I think it's really important on day one, you identify who your client is. Who do you work for? I think that that changes pretty much the way you approach the job. If you are a captive preferred vendor to an insurance company, if you agree to insurance company program work, it, you're in an awkward position. And the reason why is because you have signed an agreement with the insurance carrier and you agree to certain um, performance in that preferred program in order to qualify to be on that preferred program. You go back to your office, you get your, your phone rings and it's Mrs. Jones. She says, I have a water damage loss at my house. Can you do the work? And you say, sure I can, I'll be on my way out there right now. And you sit down at her table and you get her to sign your contract. Did you tell the, this prospect customer that you are already in a contractual agreement with the insurance carrier promising certain performance that might conflict with what your agreement promises to give the customer? You said, I'm going to restore your structure to you know, uh, acceptable conditions, pre-loss. You might even say, according to standard practices, uh, you know, the S500. And yet she doesn't know that you've already signed an agreement with the insurance company. It says, you promise you're not gonna do it the standard way. You're gonna limit it to three days of drying. You're going to uh, only charge us for this much labor. You're going to you know, uh, uh, not do what needs to be done unless you have our approval. You know, These are some of the, the, the types of promises they make you agree to in the preferred programs. Now, if you were a consumer and didn't know that there was a secret agreement between you and the insurance company, how comfortable would you be with that? What kind of liability exposure are you facing when there are two contracts in play on the same job? There's a problem. You're serving two customers and you can't. You can't serve two customers at least not without disclosing it to all parties, right? That's a problem. And when she signed your agreement and you said, I, you promised that you're going to do this, this, and this, and the insurance company says, we're not going to let you do that, that, and that. That's, there's a conflict there. That's, you can't fulfill your contractual obligations. You're in a mess, a mess of a situation. And I'm going to invite you to look at that and think about, how can I do this without stepping on a landmine? David, what do you say about that? Every risk can be managed, all right? But you have to define it first. If you happen to, I have clients that are preferred vendors. They're ethical preferred vendors. Consequently, they do an awful lot of work that their vendor program won't pay them for but they do it because they know they need to do it and to make their first contract, which is their fiduciary obligation. And guys, fiduciary obligations have very particular legal meaning, all right? There is no greater obligation under the law than that of a fiduciary to the individual that they serve. Sign that contract to their fiduciary. Um, you can make them whole. And if you can make a business model out of doing, you know, charging for 60% uh, of the work and doing 100, then, you know, that's a business decision. Everybody gets to make that. You guys can absolutely do it. Um, I will reiterate Ken's initial, initial observation. <laughs> so Who is working for whom? No, no, no. And this is, this is super fair. I mean, it's, I, I put together an onboarding system for clients and for insurers, and all it does is run them through and explain to the client, this is what the standard of care says.
would you like us to begin your mitigation immediately? Would you like for us to maintain the environment so that the insurance company can can do their inspections? Would you like for us to find all the moisture all the moisture readings? And it says underneath it, so the insured gets what why it is that they should be doing this. You know what this really is? It's a matter of narrative. A claims a claims project up front, a loss at the beginning is all about the technical. But by the time we get to the end, it's no longer about the technical, it's about hearts and minds. Both sides have taken and crafted narratives. Maybe they're honest, maybe they're dishonest on either side. Maybe they reveal the truth, maybe they didn't reveal the truth. Regardless, at the end of the day, it's for the heart and mind of the contract or for the insured because the insured has the power because the insured has the policy. All right, whatever the insured believes is reasonable is going to be the point that leverages the remainder of the loss. If you have an insured that believes you absolutely did everything right and the, and the tenor of emails to the carrier is, I understand, they were here every day, they noticed you every day, told you what they were doing every day, they sampled like they were supposed to, you got my copy of my standards directive where I required them to do all the things the standard of care. I put my check mark in it and I signed the bottom of it. And my contractor signed the bottom of it saying he'd provide it. And then we sent it to you and you did nothing. So I'm not quite sure why it is that you think you're not paying for this claim because I got news for you. It's absolutely encouraged to be fully noticed. And there you go. The tenor of a email or phone call or conversation like that generally winds up with you having a check in your hand in five to seven days. If the insurance company can worm their way back in because you leave a void, you do that. You fail to tell the story. You tell the creed. You fail to create the narrative, and you and you fail to do it in a way that's integrous. Do not lie. Do not cheat. Do not steal. If you make a mistake, tell everybody. Tell everybody and fix it. There's no better day than today to do that. You can quantify your loss and take care of it today. I made this mistake. I fixed it like this. Anybody else think there's anything else necessary? Be transparent. Number one, do the right thing. Number two, tell the truth. It'll find you out anyway. Number three, be transparent because everyone will figure out everything in one way or the other. And number four, someone's going to create a narrative. It better be you and it better be really, really, really attached to number one and two and three, right? Because you can weather anything that comes after that. So in reality, what Ken gets to is who does your client work for and or who does your who does your contractor work for and do you realize that you as an insured are actually incredibly empowered if you just have good data so whether it's a pa or a contractor sharing the standard of care and the statute with the insured so that the insured can press this guys we got to get over this knight in shining armor sir galahad thing I don't know if you've noticed, but more often than not, when you rush off to the rush off to the castle to defend the village that cried for your help, it's the villagers under pressure that shoot you in the back. It's not the king of the castle; he has plans for you later, all right? It's the it's the it's the damsel back there saying, "Oh, help me, help me, kind sir knight," right? Shooting you in the back when they start raining arrows from the king, and that's what happens in the middle of our loss. The insurance company presses the insured. The insured turns out of economic necessity not being fully grounded in the truth and fully committed to what they should get. The one really useful use of entitlement that exists, all right, being fully entitled to what they've been contracted for and demand the work be done properly. You don't realize you can do that. People have no idea, no concept whatsoever. And I think contractors and clients are the poor for the fact guess what? Nobody's teaching them. Some people seem to think that an insured that's not bothered is better. But I tell you, those are the kind of insurance that generally turn on you. If they don't want to be bothered, once they get what they want, they're going to turn. Perhaps that's better for another segment of the market than it is for you. Maybe you want to work for people who want the work you want to provide done. Maybe you want people that want excellent work, good communication, good documentation, so they don't have to sell their house for a, for a diminution of value because there's leftover damage that can't be quantified. Maybe that's not your client. So 
know who your client is, know your contractor is, know who your contractor works for. And if you're a contractor, I, I just can't say how, how much I would encourage you to educate your clients. Oops, I went away there. Can you hear me still? Yeah, we can yeah. hear you. Yeah. Good, good comment, I, I can't tell you. I can't tell you how much I would, I would encourage you as much risk as it gives to you. Because if you tell them what the standard of care is and you fail to deliver it, all right, someone's going to hold you accountable. That's okay. I think you can do. I know you can do your job professionally and ethically. I know it. I've done it for 20 years, and I teach companies to do it all over the U.S. You can do it. You've got to have to break, however, this attachment you have to a system that wants you to rush in, do work fast, not document anything, and then fight at the end over the validity and veracity of what you did, none of which serves your client, none of which at the end really serves you. We, we're trained. We're like Pavlov's dog. The, the phone rings, and we're off to go extract water, cross-contaminate houses, do three days of loss, and leave it moldy. All right? <laughs> and we don't even hardly think about it. It's such a well-worn path. I would like to interrupt that with the standard of care and statutes and empowerment and education for our clients whom we fiduciarily serve. They trust us with their houses and their lives. What do we do with that trust? My parting thought. Thank you very, very much. And, and as has been stressed so much, so much before and has been stressed even these two ending Results. Documentation is key to everything, and I don't think that's been stressed enough. Um, no matter how many times we stress it, so document and and recognize your fiduciary responsibility as we move forward. Um, have a wonderful day, and may may less and less people need us, but yeah. sadly, I like life happens.